you're joining us live here from Davos and we've got uh, 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 the CEO of uh, NASPAS and uh, Chris is here to talk to us about what he has seen happening at Davos over the years. He's been coming over the past six years and Chris, you were telling me earlier as we come up to chat that some things haven't changed but some things have changed. What hasn't changed? <laughs> Uh, Godfrey, nature hasn't changed. No? Look at this, it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. But the people change and the power structures change. For example, in 2007, right. the bankers were boisterous and having the late night parties. And then after the financial crash in 2009, they were hiding behind the rubbish bins. And now they're sort of <laughs> <laughs> recovering, they're peeking out of the bus shelters, not sure whether they've been forgiven. <laughs> But you've noticed something that that's more important, I think, that we need to pick on here. I mean, when you walk around, what strikes you are the different nationalities that yes. you see walking around yes. you that are attending the sessions, yes. etc. But there's one race that's missing. It's the largest race in the world. It's the Chinese. True. Why are the Chinese not here when they are the rescuers of the world in this environment? Godfrey, what an excellent question. Now, Davos is scheduled this year very early, and the Chinese New Year equally. So Davos falls directly after the Chinese New Year. So it's like organizing a world conference at Kathmandu and being on the 26th of, of December, right. the day after Christmas, and you know, being surprised that the Americans are not turning up. Absolutely, <laughs> they're still eating the attack. <laughs> I think it's simply the Europeans are not getting it. You know, China is so important. You can't schedule a conference like this without taking them into But account. But that's incredible because everyone that's talking around here, when you attend the sessions, you yes. hear about how the Chinese, with their big pocket, which is 3.2 trillion US dollars, are the people who are going to be able to rescue Europe out of the current morass that it is in. So. Let's talk about what you guys are doing inside Europe and what you're doing in China. How, do, how is that working out? We work mainly in emerging markets. Yeah. So the, uh, That strategy is unchanged. It's not going to change. We've been doing it for about 12 years. So it's China, Russia, Brazil, India and 48 countries in Africa. It's quite interesting if you look here. Four years ago, the the developed world would have dominated all the sessions and all the solutions would come from them and the emerging world was supposed to sit there and listen. Yeah. And you can see everything has changed. So when an Indian government official stands up to speak, everyone yeah. listens. Right. You know, when let's say a Danish or a Dutch one stands up stands up, they say, Well, yeah, maybe you know, In fact one of the comments one of the comments made by one of the economists was that the lenders have now become the, 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 the borrowers and the borrowers have now become the lenders. I think it's very refreshing. You know, and also what you can see is the, uh, the uh, emerging world is gaining confidence. Just see what happens inside the sessions. Five years ago, because the Americans, I studied in America, right. I lived there for four years, and at school you learned to speak. So in a session the Americans would speak and they would dominate the sessions. Maybe they talk sense, but they'll still be very dominant. And for example, the Indians would say nothing. Now right. they've gained confidence. So right. They get up, they speak, and people listen. And I think it's a much more healthy exchange between 200 countries in the world, not dominated by a few. Sure, one of the bright spots now certainly has become Africa. And when, yes. we, when you're listening to the conversations yes. now, we are the one place where people are beginning to say, we should actually be looking at Africa. Now, of course, True. you have been in Africa for a long yeah. time, you're an African, and you have been developing inside, in, inside Africa. But we've seen a change in the pace of development True. in terms of your business in South Africa yeah. versus outside the rest of yeah. the continent, in terms of growth. Just explain to us that strategy. I think Africa is a very good place to do business. Where are you looking at? We are operating in 48 countries, all of the sub-Saharan African countries, and we're now profitable in all of them. And we never pay a bribe. We do the business honestly and simply. And what's happened, I think, is that the institutions have improved. So the reserve banks, the tax authorities, the, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say the regulators in communications, they've all improved right. all across Africa. The second thing is Europe is burdened by historical debt, so sure. people have entitlements, so they have big pensions, and they've got big medical schemes, and no one knows how that's going to be paid. And Africa doesn't have that, so Africa has the benefit of being young and fresh. Sure. It's like a new family, you know, a family without baggage and without history, rising up, and Europe is like an old family with five generations, yeah. the old grandma yeah. still sits there yeah. with a stick.